At this point, it's really my great pleasure to introduce and present to you the president of Ball State University, Dr. Johnny Worthen. Thank you very much, Jim. I've been looking forward to this moment for a long time. It's the beginning of a new academic year, the beginning of a new presidency, and several of you are beginning your work at Ball State University. Let us begin together. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts and observations as your new president. I consider it a great honor to serve as your president and to join with all of you in working on the challenges that lie before us. During my first two months, I've tried to meet as many members of the university and as many people in the community and state as time has permitted. In my first week at Ball State, I met with faculty leaders, student leaders, the staff council, vice presidents, deans, and other administrators, visited several offices, residence halls, and a few summer programs. I also made a series of trips around the state to talk with legislators and leading citizens. I met with the governor and later with some of his staff. We have already had a number of meetings with the Commission on Higher Education. Several people have been helpful in introducing me to leaders in the Muncie community. And in mid-July, I had the pleasure of meeting a large group of Indianapolis alumni in the new Hoosier Dome. In August, we met with alumni in the South Bend, Mishawaka area. My purpose in all of these meetings and discussions has been to try to learn as much as possible about Ball State, the community, and the state of Indiana. It's important to know how different people view our university. Where do they think we are at the present time? Where should we be in the next five or ten years? What's our reputation out there? What are our strengths and weaknesses? How are we perceived? The first few weeks provide a unique opportunity for a new president. For example, I'm concerned and interested in the university, but I'm not yet so ensnarled in the problems and history of the institution that I can't be somewhat objective, so I've tried to take advantage of this time to listen, to learn, and to ask for advice. There are, of course, other reasons, other purposes for these visits. One was to begin to develop a relationship with the key state representatives and senators, the governor's budget staff, and the Commission for Higher Education, because these are the persons who will be making decisions about the university's financial future. Another purpose was to give people the opportunity to see what the new president is like. A number of people are interested in learning whether I will support their pet project. Some are simply curious to see the kind of person who would accept this difficult assignment, leave a very nice community in another state, move his family and all of our belongings, and do all of this for a non-tenure track one-year contract. <laughs> Seriously, I would like you to know that long before any final decisions were made by the search committee, both Sandra and I became convinced that Ball State University would be an excellent place to work. After two months and conversations with hundreds of people in the university and throughout the state, we are even more sure. We are very glad to be here. Let me share with you now some of what I have learned. First, Ball State has a good reputation in our state. People are extraordinarily positive about what this university has accomplished and what it is doing now. And perhaps most important, there is almost unanimous agreement that the university has great potential. Second, I was impressed with the support that legislative leaders expressed for the university. They see the institution as one which makes an important contribution in a number of areas. They believe the university is well managed, that the faculty is excellent, and that students receive a first-rate education here. We hope this means they will think we are worthy of support when we bring our capital and operating budget requests to them in the next few months. I should point out also that legislative leaders, and especially the governor, 
we're quite direct in encouraging the university to give serious consideration as to how we can assist in the economic development of the state of Indiana. Obviously, we make a very significant contribution in educating undergraduate and graduate students. But I am certain we will be pressed over the next year or two to find additional ways to support what is clearly a statewide goal, development of the state's economy. A third observation, the alumni are very positive about their educational experience at Ball State and are willing to work to support the institution. Finally, members of the Muncie community see the university as a tremendous asset, and many are very supportive and interested in our programs and activities. I also received a good deal of advice and some suggestions. Some suggested that the university needs to decide what kind of institution it wants to be, that is, to clarify its mission and direction. Some observed that the university would benefit from continuity and leadership. It was also suggested that attention be given to establishing effective working relations among faculty administration and trustees, and that the university could make great strides if we all work together. Generally, I found people's perception to be very similar to the way the faculty, the staff, the students, and trustees had described the university when we visited during the interview process. Everyone seems to agree that Ball State is a people-oriented place and that we are blessed with well-trained, competent faculty who care about whether students learn, with loyal, dedicated staff who really produce for the institution, and a group, and a group of experienced and effective administrators who manage well. My assessment of Ball State, having put on my consultant's hat for two months, is that we are a very solid university with excellent people, good facilities, a beautiful campus, and lots and lots of promise. I can't help but feel excited about this new year, and I hope you feel that way too. I think Ball State is a great place to be in 1984. The second major task which I have been working on during the first two months is the preparation of the capital budget and the operating budget requests. We have been refining these two requests and presenting our needs to several different statewide groups. For example, the Commission for Higher Education staff, the Capital Budget Committee, and the State Budget Committee, which includes several legislators, have all visited the campus in the past six weeks. We've had the opportunity to host these important visitors, to explain our needs, justify our requests, tour the facilities which need to be upgraded, and respond to their questions and concerns. In general, we've been pleased with the interest shown by our visitors and their response thus far to our presentations. We will continue to give considerable attention to this biennium budget process, which as you know, involves several steps through the fall and winter culminating with decisions made by the General Assembly in late April. For the President, few tasks are more important than working to obtain the resources so the faculty and staff can do the best job possible in teaching, research, and public service. As a result of conversations with people from around the state and the more pointed discussions with those reviewing our budget requests, I think I am safe in saying that as a university, we do not seem to be facing a major crisis. At the same time, there are some very difficult problems and tough challenges which we need to address. Let me identify a few of these. The first is a problem, one which you are well aware. We need to find ways to increase the salaries of our faculty and the salaries of our staff. Because more than three-fourths of our budget is spent on salaries and benefits, you can understand how difficult it is to find the additional budget dollars to make the kind of salary improvements which are needed. We have included funds in our operating request for the next biennium to increase both faculty and staff salaries. We think our position is sound, that we can make a strong justification for these additional funds. We will continue to make these arguments as we move through the budget process in the weeks ahead. If we are to continue to compete for outstanding faculty on a national basis, we must address this problem. 
Although we are not competing on a national basis for staff personnel, it is clear that salary improvements for the staff, a group of people who are extremely dedicated and make a tremendous contribution to the education and support functions of our university are significantly lower than they should be. Over the next year, we will be taking a hard look at these salary programs with the aim of finding ways to make the needed improvements. It will not be easy, however, <clears throat> and that's the reason I refer to it as a problem. Let me now turn to some of the challenges. One of the real challenges which we face has already been referred to by Provis Cook. Namely, how can the university help improve the quality of education in the public schools and at the same time strengthen our teacher education programs in the university? About 18 months ago, a number of reports were issued indicating the quality of our public schools has declined over the last several years and as a result, the nation is at risk. Although there are many deficiencies and inadequacies in these reports, I must tell you that I agree with the basic conclusions that elementary and high school students could learn a great deal more than they are at present and that universities need to do a better job with the new teachers we are sending to schools. One of our tasks as a university is to find ways to attract more and better students into teaching and then give them the education they need to be enthusiastic and effective teachers. Ball State must play a leadership role in responding to this challenge. It will not be easy, but it must be done. A second important challenge is to learn how to use the new technology, such as computers and video and telecommunications equipment to do a more effective job in teaching students. We know that technology cannot solve all of our instructional problems, but in the hands of skilled professors, it may become an important aid in the teaching learning process. One thing seems certain, the computer and video disc are devices which seem to motivate students. Some students whose attention span is short in more traditional teaching learning situations are able to work in an interactive way with the computer for long periods of time or concentrate effectively on subject matter presented visually. In addition, the use of technology requires a certain systematic disciplined approach on the part of the student, which can't help but contribute to our goal of teaching critical thinking. The task for you as faculty will be to search for ways to exploit this resource for our students. As Provost Cook has indicated, we are also suggesting that the state support our proposal for more equipment and for more technical personnel to assist faculty. We have also asked for funds to permit us to transmit credit and non-credit programs around the state using the latest telecommunications technology. Working with the new technology is a challenge, but it may be more appropriate to view it as an opportunity. The time to move vigorously into this area is now. We cannot afford to miss this opportunity. When we talk of challenges, we often focus on new programs or new thrusts. Perhaps the most difficult challenge is how we keep good academic programs functioning at a high level, even though no new or innovative changes are planned. In the short time I've been here, I've been told about excellent teaching or research being done in architecture and planning, business, nursing, the human performance lab, psychology, nutrition, allied health, the Center for uh, Energy Research, education, journalism, economics, the writing program, music, foreign languages, and computer sciences. And I'm sure the same can be said for many disciplines which I have not mentioned. The point is that a great many faculty in a number of different departments are doing a superb job. The challenge is how to keep the enthusiasm and the effectiveness of the faculty high throughout the university. Although this is a challenge shared by all of us in the faculty and administration, I want you to know I'm very much interested in this question, and I would welcome your suggestions. The last challenge I want to discuss is how we continue our thrust toward quality and at the same time provide access to higher education for a broad segment of our student population. It's essential to maintain high academic standards in the classroom 
and admit only those students to upper level courses and degree programs who have demonstrated they can do satisfactory work. But as a public state assisted university with a mission to provide access, we cannot reject students who, although not as well prepared as the average student, still have the capability and motivation to learn and who with additional knowledge and skills could meet our academic standards. The province has outlined some proposals for dealing with these less well-prepared students. The centerpiece being the proposal to establish a university college. I'm very supportive of this concept, but I'm also aware that implementation will not be easy. It will require a special cooperative and creative effort. Many people have asked me in these first two months if I would delineate goals for the coming year. Until I've had the opportunity to talk with more faculty and students, it's simply premature to try to be very specific. On the other hand, I do believe there are two overriding goals on which we can all agree. I would like to propose our work over the next several years be guided by these two basic ideas. First, the goal of quality. As a university, we must stand for quality. Indeed, the integrity of the university is in jeopardy if we do not press for quality. We must strive to be excellent in everything we do within the limits of our resources. This value or attitude needs to permeate the university. I offer two reasons. If we don't press for quality in everything we do, whether it be in our academic programs, in the physical plant, in student affairs, in public relations, in athletics, or in our research activities, there is always the danger, indeed the probability, of falling to the level of mediocrity. It is frequently easier to do what is comfortable. Sometimes we have to stretch ourselves to be as good as we are capable of being. The second reason I think we must press for quality is so we can be models for our students. I would hope that students would graduate from Ball State University with considerable knowledge and skills and with the attitude that they will try to do the best job they can no matter where they are or what they're working on. In other words, I hope our graduates will continually strive to realize their potential as fully as possible. We need to demonstrate our commitment to that same philosophy if we are to convince our students. That means not being satisfied with anything less than the best we can give. That's the way I define commitment to quality. The second important goal which I propose we embrace is that we continue a Ball State tradition that we care about the student. By caring, I mean we have a concern for the student, and in particular, a concern that each student learns and that he or she works up to his or her potential. In this sense, the two goals are intertwined. I do not mean to suggest that our primary goal should be to serve students or to wait upon them or to encourage them to be dependent upon us. Rather, I mean that because we care about whether they learn, we're willing to set high expectations and to stretch them. When they don't meet these standards, however, we don't reject them. We look for ways to give them the skills and the motivation they need to be successful. I'm aware this is a difficult problem, and it's not always resolved in the same way with every student, but it's worth working on. One of the ways Ball State is different from some of the very large research-oriented universities is that we care about students. The faculty is the key group in demonstrating this concern by being accessible to students, by setting high expectations, and helping students to meet these standards. It would be very desirable if Ball State were recognized as the university which cares most about students and their academic success. Over the next several months, we will want to develop more specific goals. These will grow out of the university planning process, which will be put in motion early this autumn quarter. Each of you will have the opportunity to provide input through the planning process. I would assume, however, our specific program goals 
will fall under these two overriding themes, a concern for quality and a concern for the student. I hope you share with me that although the challenges may be tough and the goals to which we aspire may be difficult to attain, they are worth our best efforts. Over the past 21 years, I've been very fortunate to serve in leadership positions in two very good public universities, one in a very small state and one in a large state. As many of you, I've lived through several different eras in higher education, beginning with the post-Sputnik period in the early 60s, which was char characterized by rapid growth in enrollments and lots of money for new programs. This was followed by the student unrest period, which generated a number of changes in the way universities deal with students. In the 1970s, the economy turned down and we experienced very tight budgets and cut in expenditures were commonplace. During this time, we began to give much more attention to the recruitment of minority students. In some institutions, faculty unions replaced university senates. In the past few years, we've entered an era with when the number of students graduating from high schools has begun to decline precipitously, and this will surely affect enrollments in the future. Although budgets are not as tight as they once were, we have never really received sufficient funds to catch up in areas where we fell behind in the 70s, for example, in the salary area and in the academic equipment area. It's almost inevitable that over this period of time, the last 20 years or so, a university administrator will have been confronted with most of the issues in higher education. So I come to Ball State this year with a sense of anticipation and a sense of confidence. Confidence gained from some very solid experience with a variety of higher education issues in universities not too different from Ball State. I feel very comfortable here already to a large degree because I'm familiar with the traditions and goals and mission of a public university such as Ball State. I'm ready to begin this year and I know you are too. Let's agree to work together to move the university forward. When many of us are gathered here in 1994, it is my hope that we'll be able to say that Ball State is a stronger university than it was in 1984 and that each of us is proud to have played a part in that accomplishment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wortham, and thank you also, uh, Professor Hoban. Uh, immediately following now our collegiate meetings, and again, let me remind you of the reception that Dr. and Mrs. Worthen will hold this afternoon, uh, 3 to 5 p.m. in Cardinal Hall. Thank you.